John Leaf, thank you so much for joining us again on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast. It's so great to see you. Well, it's my great pleasure. It's really wonderful. And I am present this time, John. I, I, made, I made great effort to make sure I was here. I was so disappointed to miss you last time, uh, but loved listening to you and now uh, really enjoying the prospect of, of uh, chatting with you now. Now, last time we got into the, um, the book, The Secret Language of Cells, um, which is an absolutely fascinating read, and we'll leave links in the show notes for everyone to get onto the book. And we sort of finished our conversation last time, um, you know, promising that we will have you back and we'll talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the practical applications of the things that you've been discovering. So I thought that would make a great conversation. And, and also, I think, John, even some of the philosophy of it, uh, mm. too, which is which is which is always a practical, uh, uh, you know, is always practically helpful for people. So perhaps if you just, uh, uh, you know, do you want to just start a, a, a sort of a flow of consciousness here or uh, what, what do you think? Well, when I wrote the book, I I clearly have a viewpoint and I clearly have uh, I mean, the name of my website is Searching for the Mind in Nature. So I'm looking to see where is mind throughout nature. And I studied insects and went down all the way to cells and found them to be very intelligent. Uh, but, the, you know, the human brain is a massive, amazing human brain where we cannot find consciousness, where there's no seat of consciousness, where there's no structure or module of consciousness. Uh, and all the things uh, that we think of as the mind, you know, memory, there, there, we, we don't have good structures that we can find in the brain. So the, it's very hard to figure out what the mind is. And then if you look at animals, birds are incredibly intelligent and they're, they're uh, you know, tiny little brains. Lizards are incredibly intelligent. And I went all the way down to bees and termites and ants studying brains and found how amazingly intelligent they are. But, but the most amazing thing that really got me going in my 10 years of blogging is when I was translating gobbledygook, uh, you know, molecular biology and molecular genetics into English, which is what I was doing. Yeah. Um, I uh, the cells. It comes down to cells and and, and the, how smart they are, how amazingly they are, they are. And then to find that everywhere I looked, everything was based on not just cells being cells, but cells talking to other cells and somehow knowing. I mean, I don't know if knowing is a word you can use with a cell, but but it's, but it, it sure looks like they know what they're doing because they're communicating with uh, cells far away from them, making decisions, calling for this one, calling for that one, making friends with microbes, um, telling cells what to do. So what I did in the book is that instead of stating the very unpopular scientific position that intelligence exists throughout nature and that consciousness is not in the brain but is everywhere that's not a good scientific viewpoint because it can't be proven first of all so that's the problem you can't prove that so i found i was just going to describe the world of the cell literally uh, as, uh, as a travel log, uh, just uh, visually to see what cells do. And that's what the book is. And I think it's overwhelmingly shows how smart these cells are and how amazingly intricate it is. Now, there are many directions to go with, to draw conclusions. Like for example, a cancer cell is actually, you know, we all know now that microbes live in colonies and they communicate and they do things together and they become friendly to the gut cells and they uh, cooperate in this and that. And then they join up and they fight against us. And of course, viruses fit in there. And that's a whole great subject we should talk about. I, I wrote, I included the viruses in there and everyone's interested in viruses. And we, we, we really don't have the right idea about viruses, but we can talk about that, that in a minute. Um, but Everywhere you look, these cells are communicating, and everything is everything is is determined by that. And um, so, one of the big examples is most of the studies are in the immune system and the uh, brain, because that's where most of the research has gone. I mean, uh, I have stuff about platelets, how smart they are. That's what blew Harvard's mind, platelets. I mean, how intelligent platelets. We don't think of platelets as smart. Capillary cells, which are the most common little 
uh, cell in the, in, the, in the blood vessels, they're the ones who tell stem cells what to do. They tell stem cells to make this kind of cell, to put it over there. They tell the, the oligodendrocyte in the brain, make myelin over here uh, and now make it and, and make this level uh, the, the capillary cell. Now, how the hell does a capillary cell know to do that? Aristotle had said that that was true. He invented this idea that blood vessels determine organs, and it turns out he was right. I mean, how did he know? I mean, it's a guess, it, just a thing he thought of, but but he was correct. Now, how 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 can we explain that? I mean, um, yeah, and it, it, it's fascinating. All this and so many of these things going on. When we were writing the uh, our book, we we sort of chose. Uh, some of these uh, brain type of areas, these areas where there are collections of, of uh, neuronal type cells. Uh, so we talked about the heart, we talked about the gut, but we also talked about the skin. And the definition that we used, I think, is very much about this going, which I think continues because, you know, we we're just making an introduction in our book, but continues. We simply use this idea of when something can autonomously generate activity uh, mm -hmm. beyond itself beyond itself and yep. which is exactly what you're saying there how a how a cell in this position can through its own activity then generate um what seems to be different activity or related activity and that's the that's the difference so a cell is not just generating its own activity because of course everyone can do that but what you're saying there is that there's a cell here that can generate uh, totally different activity in an oligodendrocyte at the the other side of the body, and I, I, I've looked at your 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 work, and we've been talking about this, and platelets were, and you've talked about this. This was just a breakthrough uh, of the of the work they do in the body of of activating the, the body systems. Can you yeah. just tell us a bit more about some of that type of frame? Yeah, so I, I focused on skin and gut, as you say, because those are the master cells that are closest to the outside environment. And therefore, it's, it, they have to make so many decisions about, uh, you know, in the gut, there's like trillions and trillions of microbes that make friends. Every, all along the gut, there are different environments, different city civilizations, and they, they determine which are friendly, which are not, and they create the mucus, and they bring them in, and the viruses help. They help fight off the enemies, and they choose which ones are going to make vitamins and which aren't going to make vitamins, and, and they teach the T cells. They have to teach the T cells uniquely not to attack that food uh, particle because they would attack every particle because it's all foreign matter. And uh, somehow T cells are trained in the thymus universities to, to recognize every single particle, even particles that have never been seen in nature before that we're creating in chemistry labs and putting in food. Um, though they recognize these and should I attack that one? Should I not? We would have food allergies all day long if the... Um, the skin cell was not telling the T cell and educating them what kind of uh, activity they should have. Um, then, they, then they call to the bone marrow, no, I need a different kind of cell. Well, this is happening and I, I need you to create this particular kind of lymphocyte and send that along and they'll send it all the way up. Uh, and then sending signals come over here uh, in this part of the body. And then I'll make signals for you to get out of the blood vessel and into the, uh, into the tissue. And once I'm in the tissue, the, 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 the master cells are gonna tell the other ones what to do um, and how to swarm around uh, uh, the bacteria. Uh, uh, it, it's just a constant communication of intelligence cells. So I, I often talk about, so, but the most is known about, about immune and the brain. Uh, I had to dig deep to get all the other areas, uh, which, which I think I described in, in the book. Um, and just as a picture of all this activity, but in the immune, the immune cells and brain cells respond to the same things. They all respond to infections. They respond to loneliness. They respond to rejection. They respond to uh, all the things of immunity and all the things that a brain you would think we would be responding to both respond and they're talking about it. So for example, when we get sick, um, 
the T cell, now no one knew T cells were in the brain. It was all called immune privileged until the last four or five years, really six years. And then they found that in the CSF, there are half a million T cells floating around communicating with neurons. And of course, the microglia is, is a macrophage. It's really an immune cell. And it, it's the T cell of the, inside the brain. It's the resident T cell. The macrophage is, a, is an immune cell that in the, uh, in the ninth day of the fetus moves into the brain and then lives there and has children. And they live in one little area relating to certain neurons and they work with the neurons in many, many ways. They're actually brain cells as well as immune cells. So they're tapping, they're, they're, they're figuring out which synapses to uh, prune. They even help uh, neurons travel. They eat holes for them to move when they need to move. Um, so, but no one knew that there were lymphatics, for example, in the brain. No one knew that until recently. And then how the brain cleans itself through sleep, which we should yes. talk about. That's but, a big one. Yeah. But so the T cell is sitting there. And when we get sick, the T cell sends a signal to the neuron and says, you're sick, you need to rest, you need to create what's called the sick feeling. So the sick feeling is, we all know what the sick feeling is, you know, we feel lousy, we have no energy, we need to lie down. And this is what's necessary for the body to have energy to fight off the infection that the T cell is directing, but it's directing the brain as well to, to cooperate with this effort. And um, so the T cell sends a pulse of signals. And when the infection's over, it's only the T cell can tell the neuron to stop the sick feeling. And then the sick feeling is alleviated, but then it continues to send a pulse, keep normal cognition. So the T cell is instructing the neuron about uh, normal cognition. The same happens with new brain cells. It's the, the new brain cells are part of the memory process. And there is definitely a memory process in the brain, in the hippocampus, but the most recent research this week even is that they can't find out where it is and, and they can't, it's, it's distributed, it's in all places. In other words, it's not one cell, it's many, many places and it's brain waves communicating between those places. A lot of electrical things going on in the brain that we don't talk about, but the uh, fields of energy. And of course um, that book, uh, about the mind that that you had me read by Dr. Versi, he talks yeah. about the field of the heart, the big field of the of the heart. So uh, electricity is huge, and that's a whole nother subject. And that's a way that it, communication is going on among the cells. And it's known that groups of cells in the memory communicate at one frequency for the location of a memory, and at another frequency for the the time uh, in the memory. So they're communicating, many, but we can't pin it down. We don't know where the memory is. And the memory really is all over. It's all in all kinds. And it's obviously in the immune cells. There are things called memory immune cells that remember all kinds of activities. So when we make a new neuron is minted about a thousand a day as an older person, and that is associated then with new memories, it helps it helps create networks related to that new memory, which gradually takes over from the older memory. Uh, and that's how you can get rid of uh, trauma by using that process to rework the memory uh, uh, and add love to an old memory and gradually chip away at the, at the, at the trauma. But the, um, it's the T cell telling the stem cell to make the neuron. So when we get depression, and about a third to 40% of depression is really what I call an immune depression. It's really um, uh, an inflammatory depression. Not all of them, but it's, you know, depression is probably eight different things. I mean, eight completely different things. And if you look at eight symptoms and you have four, you have 64 different possibilities. So, I mean, there's a huge... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, the, this, the definition of depression is also as questionable as the definition of intelligence. Uh, but it's the T cell telling the neuron to make, and when we get depression, it says slow down, make less. And when yeah. we get severe, so that's where you get the brain fog of depression and the brain fog of, of, of long stress. Acute stress is, you remember, you remember better, but as soon as stress goes on, you remember worse. So again, 
that communication is going on and the brain is all of it. The brain is in the immune system and in the brain. And, and then the of brain. course, in the opposite direction, yeah. the, what we've learned is that the neuron can create any kind of inflammation and it can create many different kinds. And it's actually a form of neuroplasticity. It's just, it's a way that we learn for the neuron actually creating immune structures. And everyone used to wonder, I don't even, I don't know if we talked about this last time or not, but people wonder, we know that meditation relaxes us through uh, affecting uh, the heart and the, and the breathing through the vagus nerve, but no one knew how could it affect immunity until we realized that neurons create cytokines and communicate with yeah. immunes. Therefore, the vagus nerve is communicated and changing 200 uh, immune markers uh, with meditation. So anyway, I'm kind of no, moving on. No, but this, is, this is brilliant and fabulous. Uh, just bringing out you know, what, what you know, Matt and I were talking about is, Okay, so I'm a therapist out there, and I hear all this stuff. Uh, and I think there are a couple of things I just, just want to point out. Matt, I, I know you've got a couple there that you've grabbed. And one of the things that the sickness behavior you, you were talking about there, and then depression you were talking about there, the, um, that what happens on the, uh, the phenotype, the observable uh, element, are these emotional responses? I mean, one of the elements of sickness behavior is I want to be alone. Well, of course, this is also evolutionarily very helpful because if you've got an infection, you you uh, you don't want to be spreading that sort of uh, spreading that. So that emotional aspect and in depression, those things of slow down, take it easy. Well, this is your cells, as you've described so beautifully, your cells are already on it. They're already saying we're going to slow down. We're going to do less. We're going to do brain fog. But we fight it. And, and the thing I wrote down, I just want to sort of read this question, Matt, and then you jump in. And I said, how much do we need to consciously intervene or interfere uh, as different to just create the circumstances for the system to activate itself? Mm. <clears throat> yeah. We seem to be very busy as therapists helping. Are, you know, can we do help? What's the best way to help the cells to do their work? Yeah. Well, I wish I had an answer to that, and we could get the Nobel Prize here uh, for Yay. answering. <laughs> um, the, I think years ago, when when medications came in in the fifties and sixties and seventies, everyone says, "Oh, they're going to cure all these illnesses," and they used it as a way to wipe out psychotherapy in very mm -hmm. stupid ways. And uh, the insurance company says, oh, it's, it's biochemical, you don't need psychotherapy. And of course, even in those days, they proved that psychotherapy was absolutely invaluable with schizophrenia, with degenerative illnesses, with all kinds of things that we don't even today use it enough of. The, the new understanding of how dynamic the brain is and how uh, everything is changing and it's constantly uh, communicating um, is that the way we use our brain really determines the structures that are built and really determines the circuits. Uh, I wrote an article about how I'm an old, you know, I've specialized in old people, geriatrics, but the older brain is better than the younger brain, despite the prejudice in today's society, if if it's an active brain, if it's a, if they're active in meaningful activities, and we can talk about why meaningful matters in terms of the cells, which it does in terms of the brain, and I can describe that. But to me, what's happening is the new neuroscience is showing that it's proving the effects of psychotherapy. In other words, it's showing that the the many different ways that we interact and that we help each other, which you're saying stimulates, it has to stimulate the inherent uh, behavior of the cells or, or you know, we, we can't dig inside of someone and change their cells. So clearly the interaction is doing that in some ways. And you know more than I do about the, the masterful ways that therapists uh, do that to stimulate. I mean, sometimes you have to wait for a long time. Sometimes, you know, I used to say, and I'm not, you know, I used to supervise therapists, but I, uh, I don't have the temperament to be a great therapist, I think. But um, 
I, I preferred moving around in hospitals and seeing a lot of patients and, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And I was an expert in psychopharm. So, but I worked very, very closely with therapists all my career. And, and my partner in every single case is a, is a master uh, psychotherapist. And um, I believe that uh, we are now uh, showing um, each of these techniques uh, actually affects the brain structures, the circuits, what, 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 what is occurring. And that's what the new neuroscience is showing. So we have meditative practices to add to psychotherapy. We have the, you know, the, the kind of cognitive therapies. We have the, the deep insight, uh, emotional, uh, you know, psychoanalytic type therapies. We have, we have the, the eye movement or, or the, mm -hmm. you know, with trauma, the, the, the re-remembering and adding love to the therapy. There are so many techniques and each one I believe uh, stimulates different versions of this uh, cellular interaction, which is going on. Uh, yeah. And we're, we're now showing that, 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 that it does that. So, mm. so insurance companies can't say, you know, it doesn't work, you know, it's, it's not yeah. Yeah. logical, it's not real. Yeah. The, the separation yeah. from drugs and therapy is ridiculous. There is no separation. Mm. Sometimes the medications are necessary to jog uh, a system. And, and, and we, we sure need better medications. I mean, I, I can talk about, I'm an you know, expert psychopharm and I, I study the neuroscience and we're not there yet. I mean, there's a lot of problems with the meds, but we are learning. I think in the last five, six years, we've learned a lot about, uh, I always used to say it was much more complicated than this dopamine serotonin thing mm -hmm. and uh, norepinephrine thing. The glutamate is the basis of it. And we barely scratched the surface. I mean, if you look at the medications we have, we have like 200 medications, three or four of them are glutamate and glutamate is 80% of the brain. I mean, it, it, we're just scratching the, but now we know that when you have a dopamine, supposed dopamine effect, it's because it's affecting the serotonin, affecting the GABA, affecting the glutamate, affecting this, that, well, and, and all these circuits are intermingled uh, together. So these simplistic notions of uh, brain chemistry uh, and, and chemical imbalance are ridiculous, uh, hmm. but we're lucky that some of these, I mean, all of psychopharm, I always say when I used to lecture in psychopharm is, and God created psychopharm in 1956 and by accident, we got the <laughs> antipsychotics, the antidepressants, the benzodiazepines, lithium, the mood stabilizers, and the antidepressants by accident in about a three or four year period. And this was not through any great genius. This was just people saying, oh, hmm, I'll give this patient that. Wow, look what happens with that. And, and we didn't know what we were doing. We just, it was, they were all, and then then the, the, the research limited it. And the next accident was clausrill. Which showed right. a lot because it has so many different effects, and we realized, wow, it's much more complicated than this. Uh, and now, only now, 20, 30 years later, we're beginning to learn enough neuroscience to think about how future medications will actually work. I'm sorry, I'm uh, digressing. No, yeah, <clears throat> no, it's fantastic. But th this aspect, and, and Matt, just getting into that, because I mean, certainly, uh, John, I, I did uh, you know, psychopharmacology and the the brain and mind degree and and i love the professor he said uh, uh chlorpromazine is that it's great it, it probably kill you but it's the most uh, it's the one we we prescribe the most because we know it'll kill you so we're quite careful so this this idea that it needs a lot but but matt th this for you this way of the way of utilizing these ideas a way of implementing what yeah what, well what is, what's triggering your thoughts here yeah, lots of thoughts. I've got a whole page of them here. Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, so um, Eric and Eric Kandel, you know, uh, a few decades ago, famously, you know, said psychotherapy, you know, changes neural architecture. So and uh, what why we, you know, don't promote that more uh, is beyond me. But just looking at what you've been saying here, I mean, we have this, it's akin to our bodies are like a country, you know, there's, there's all of this autonomy going on, there's intelligence at all different levels at, uh, you know, and there's this colonies, communities, learning strategy, alliances being formed. Um, there's wisdom and memory and, uh, and all of this that we're unconscious of that's going on in our bodies. And, and surely when you think about the sum of all of this intelligence that is happening all the time, um, without our conscious awareness, we have to be out. We, we we have to look at people differently, 
don't we? I mean, you know, we, we think we've we've started to work out people, right? And then and then you come along with your book, and then we think, no, we we have no yeah. idea. <laughs> the, the self-organizing That's, capacities that yeah. we have are extraordinary. Truth is, we don't know what mind is. Mind is not the brain. And yeah. the, you know, the problem with Eric Kandel, he's a lovely man and a genius. Uh, he thinks the brain produces the mind, and I don't right. think. I don't think there's any evidence of that. I mean, I right. think that's just a materialistic cop out because the truth is we don't know what the mind is in science, but yet everyone knows what the mind is. I mean, you know, the, you have Dennett, you have people saying, oh, the mind is an epiphenomenon. It's not real. Mm -hmm. Well, that's absurd. We all know that, as a matter of fact, real people, the only thing they do know is that they have a mind. What is the mind? I know what the mind is. I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I'm feeling, I'm doing uh, my identity. So we know every person knows there's a mind, but there's no scientific explanation for it. And when you look at it, it doesn't fit into a brain. Brain is obviously part of it, and it's a definitely needed, and it's a tool of uh, mental processes, and it's a wonderful tool. Uh, but it's not the mind that exists between you and me. And it's not the mind that has created science and culture that is not in my brain, but it still exists. Uh, so, uh, and now, then when you start looking inward, you see that the mind exists distributed through all these cells. Um, and then to me, remarkably, you look at microbes and they have mind also. Is this, have we unnecessarily hamstrung ourselves though with science taking the corner of the market, so to speak, no um, without considering philosophy or other areas that science can't see into, touch? Uh, I mean, to me, uh, science has taken over and, and the dogma uh, of science, you couldn't say what I said without getting thrown out of the university, you know, probably 15, 20 years ago, uh, that cells have intelligence. I mean, it was considered stupid. Today, it's mainstream, because it's just so obvious what's happening with microbes, and how incredibly important they are, and how incredibly smart they are. Um, and, and we use them now to do things. I mean, we use them to manufacture things, to, uh, we're using them to take care of oil, we're using them for the climate change. You know, these microbes are gonna inherit the world and they've been controlling it since time began. It's been a micro mm -hmm. world. We're not the dominant figures in this. We're, we're, we're just a, a sideline player. Uh, uh, the main forces, the main things running the world are the microbes. Uh, yeah. Because yeah. I just want to jump in yeah. quickly. The, this Because I, I, Matt and I try to uh, put forward this idea of um, thinking in systems or the idea of getting away from just cause and effect, although that exists, uh, obviously. But th there are a few that have talked about mind as uh, more an emergent property of all these activities it's the right. it's that's the, the it's, it's almost that's a quality the that's the cop out view yeah. emergent property emergent property means i don't know what the hell it is right. that's what, is it, it well I don't know what it is, so it's emergent. It comes out of something. I mean, so emergent is just a word. It doesn't explain anything really. Um, it doesn't explain what it is or how it interacts and we don't know how yeah. it interacts. Yeah, it's, interesting. Uh, with, interesting. Thank you. Yeah, because mm. it does it does seem like it's heresy to suggest that science can't explain everything. We have no clue in science <laughs> what intelligence is, yeah. nothing, what consciousness is, what mind is. We have no definition that makes any sense at all. And by mm. the way, there's no definition of life. We can't define life. Mm. As, uh, and uh, Carl Zimmer has a great book about that. Uh, he, he takes every definition and shows how absurd it is. So it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a creature who can reproduce. Well, I can't reproduce anymore. Am I dead? Uh, you know, I yeah. mean, he takes every definition and shows you how, how, how ridiculous it is. But the biggest part of the, the life thing is we, so when you bring life all the way down, 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 and it's a, scientists think it's a cell that reproduces. I add to that definition, it's a cell that is smart and can communicate. So that's a little definition, but it doesn't count viruses. 
And a lot of people, should we talk a little bit about viruses? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. yeah. Sure. Or, or maybe just, not. Well, well, whole... just, just before we do, while we're still on this philosophical yeah, I'm sorry, ang but... angle, I, I'd just like to um, ask you about your, uh, do you think science has brought uh, sort of across the board into the mechanistic view of everything? So everything is, is seen through the lens of a machine model. So the, the machine is the metaphor. Well, it's always the highest level machine that exists at that time. So at one point it was, um, you know, a manufacturing kind of machine and then it became a computer. Now it's a quantum computer. So it's whatever our most advanced machine concept is. So like Penrose and Hameroff say it's a quantum computer in the microtubule. Mm. Now, yep. there may well be a quantum computer in the microtubules, but it's still not mind. Yeah. You know, yeah. It may be what is the brain's way of using mind. And uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant. And I do think there are all kinds of uh, quantum and electrical properties in the microtubules. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Uh, but we're, so even that most advanced, so seemingly advanced is, is materialistic. Um, and then you get into philosophy, which is, uh, so you have the mind and the body and you're back to Descartes and you're back to the insoluble uh, problem. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I'm part of the camp, but again, I, I love science. I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm sold on learning in great detail what we know. And there's a huge amount of science going on. And I study it every day, all day. That's what I'm doing. And yep. uh, we lost Richard again. And um, the, uh, it's back, sorry. Uh, the, uh, I love reading this stuff and I'm constantly uh, learning about science. And my idea in the book was to use the current science to show that intelligence is everywhere. Yeah. And that intelligence is all throughout nature at every level. My next book, I'm even, I'm wondering about it because it's even going to be a little more obscure because what I've been studying is taking it lower, higher and lower, like the same kind of thing of the cell, but talk about embryos, you know, brains, embryo cells, but then deep in the cell, the molecules, the large, mm. the clusters of um, where everything happens. And these clusters form uh, water, they form droplets that are phase separation, they call them. And that's where all the action is. That's where everything's happening. It's not like diffusing. We have this idea that chemicals diffuse and they find this and they find that. It happens much too fast for that. That doesn't explain it. You can't have a series of reactions, bing, bang, in milliseconds and have it diffusing and finding a molecule. These mm. are all, the cell is much, much more dense than anyone imagined. It's not a liquid. It's more like a gel. And it forms these droplets where large molecules form structures where there are little pathways for water and water sticks onto them. Water has a polar properties. So yeah. it's, it's like an ion. It's on, on the, and the, so there's these pathways, minuscule pathways between these large proteins and they form what's basically like, like a semiconductor where one little change over here where the phosphate can totally change the flow in that, uh, in that rivulet. And you have like a thousand rivulets going on. And deep in those rivulets is where the uh, action is. That's where the, in these cavities of the, uh, is where the reactions occurring. And in those cavities, what they found recently is that those cavities allow quantum uh, effects to occur because not, yes. I mean, not everything is quantum in the fact that orbitals, you know, the way we understand chemicals, but I'm talking about the extraordinary uh, quantum effects, which would be like um, uh, tunneling yep. or position, which is photosynthesis. So basically they thought this couldn't happen because it cells are so messy and quantum mechanics needs a, a thing that's just perfect environment in order to happen. Well, in these clusters of proteins in these droplets where everything happens, it forms these microenvironments where these electrical, these photonic, where these quantum effects are happening. That's what I'm writing about now is how the communication starts with cell, with brains, cells, embryos, cells, but then molecules. 
and then mm. even electrons. So the communication is going all the way down through molecules and electrons. I don't know where that, yeah. that's sort of- uh, I'm just, I'm just gonna go, I, 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 wow, uh, let's just do wow. But this is, this is so important, John, because we talk a lot about, um, you know, top, top down uh, processes, yep. you know, sort of mentalizations, you know, the point of therapy, you know, uh, interventions. And what you're talking about is an insight. And I know it's just an insight. We've got, a, you know, we haven't closed the book on anything uh, into all the way down, uh, going down. We're now down into the molecules. Of course, uh, DNA is playing around in this whole story as well, creating possibilities. This quantum aspect, I mean, there's a little bit that we alluded to uh, in a previous book um, about the nature of uh, quantum activity and things like, uh, you know, smell and a, a few other processes. We're, yeah. we're just scratching around and uh, everybody's got to pay attention to uh, Dr. John Leaf because this is really prophetic stuff. And well, what, what it shows, we're hung up on this Darwin thing and Darwin was a great man and he was a genius. Mm -hmm. He's not he wasn't what they're saying he was. He, he was greater than his followers today who are narrow-minded and dogmatic. 99% of, of nature is cooperation, not conflict. There yes. is conflict, obviously, and competition. Of course, there's natural selection, mm -hmm. but most of it is communication, which is uh, cooperation. Mm -hmm. So... The whole, all the way down from the humans, the earth, down the embryos, cells, molecules, clusters, atoms, is cooperation. It's all cooperation and intelligent signaling. So that's, uh, I, I, you know, that's considered insane. I mean, because really, I mean, when I say cells are intelligent, okay, that's becoming mainstream because of the, what we're learning about microbes. And I often say, like, how do we know... Uh, like, why are microbes so important? I mean, how are they so influential? Well, the reason is simple. They speak the same language as our cells. They were yeah, able to right. talk. Everyone's talking to each other. And that's why they can influence. Otherwise, they couldn't influence. And viruses are part of that picture. Uh, the virus yeah. is sick. We now know that viruses communicate also. That's new information in the last four or five years. But that's a whole field. It's called sociovirology, which is yeah. there's now 15 languages known of viruses. Uh, and uh, that's a whole great story, uh, but the so so but it's so the intelligence is integral to every, at every level, all the way up and all the way down. And so I don't know what to do with that, except I'm going to describe it. I mean, uh, the yeah. the cellular level allows me to talk about things that therapists may be more interested in: sleep and exercise and uh, trauma and all that. This other stuff. I have to see yet what where it's going to go, but I, I feel necessary to describe it. So that's what I'm working on. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's important our perception of who we are, and uh, again, just like you described, the uh, all of the uh, agreements that are happening, you know, within us and and without us, um, is just important in how we perceive one another, how we look at the the client across the room. Um, because there's a whole lot more going on than whatever your theory of psychotherapy is in your own mind. And I think this, these are just very, very important things to understand. I mean, we might not be able to understand them at the depth that, that you do, um, but just to have a, a, a concept, you know, that, that there I mean, is all of this going on. Sometimes you direct, sometimes you just sit there, sometimes mm. you're just being with the person, sometimes you're they just you're listening you're just you know it's necessary for someone there are so many ways that a, humans interact yeah and therapy the master thing of therapy is to use all of that to uh find out and to help uh patients with their vastly different kinds of situations and problems i mean and you alluded you alluded sorry Matt, just quickly because you alluded to something before which I like to point out to, to therapists is that that we see the body reaction in these half second, one second sort of uh, cognitive behavioral responses. But as, as you're saying, these uh, biomolecular things, they're happening in milliseconds. So, the, so there's thousands and thousands of things going on before your client says, oh, I'm feeling a little. So there's a lot 
uh, there's a lot and what you what you highlight and what's been so extraordinary I mean I think there will be some people sitting there saying I just didn't follow some of that stuff but that doesn't matter there was a path to follow uh, and uh, that's the important thing that if you can just create and get the the client moving and activating that the body has a lot that it can say with what you say uh if if well, i can. Well, yeah we don't it's vastly infinitely complicated mm. uh, yeah. we don't but we spark it we spark we able to, yeah beautiful we, mm. we help unblock it we help uh, the flow we help it move uh, not not uh big, everything is movement i mean uh, yeah everything's flow isn't it mm. i talk about um like using the brain is the most important thing, how you use it. And mm. I often give a story of, um, of a, a high jumper who's going visualizing his high jump before he jumps. And by visualizing a high jump, he does it 30% better than he would. But if while he's visualizing the high jump, when he jumps in the high jump, he goes like that with his arms, it's 45% better. Well, that's a little crazy. Why would that be? Well, the reason is because it's using more of the brain. It's using the body. It's using the body cells, the mind cells, the concentration cells, the visualization cells. It's called what I call whole brain neuroplasticity, large circuits, and includes also the immunes and includes the physical muscles. All of it is involved. So, for example, to me, this large circuit neuroplasticity is how we have amazing experiences. So what's the most amazing experience people have? Well, often a musical religious event. You know, uh, they're at a, a church service or at a, a you know, something, you know, or a rock concert, something. Anyway, they know the musicians. They know the history of the musicians. They know the song, the words. They know the meaning of the words. They know who they're with. They know the people around them. Their body is moving. They're pulsing. There's rhythm going on. There's melody going on. There's, and in a church thing, there's meaning, deep meaning. All of this is stimulating all these parts of the cells, and therefore the memory and the experience is huge. Yeah. And those are the most meaningful things because they're imbuing all these different parts of the body. So the circuit, what I call the circuit of neuroplasticity, which is the learning, uh, the experiential effect is massive. Um, and that's why I, th you know, people say, should I do uh, crossword puzzles when I'm old? I say, yeah, you could do crossword puzzles, but you'll be good at crossword puzzles. That's not going to help you that much. You need to do something meaningful. You need to be focused. You need to be, be physically involved. You need to be crouching, doing gardening. You need to be working. You need to be thinking. You need to be into it. Uh, Meditation is part of it. Uh, but more, you need more than that. You need a meaningful activity. And that's what's growing the brain. And that's what makes the brain bigger and better. And that's why exercise is so important. That's why, you know, cleaning the body, eating properly is so important. Uh, yeah. Now, you <clears throat> you started touching on the aging brain earlier. And I, I was keen to sort of jump back into that since my brain is aging. <laughs> so <laughs> Yours? Whoa. <laughs> oh, there's prejudice in the materialistic culture that old people get demented and there is a lot of dementia. So, you know, and, uh, and a lot of people are couch potatoes and they, they are losing it. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is the studies, and I wrote a post of, of all the latest details is that the old, we used to call it wisdom. I mean, you know, today, you know, no one knows what wisdom is. It's not part of the vocabulary of these, of, of the young people, but the, the older brain that is doing what I'm talking about, having meaningful activity with their brain, has built many, many more circuits. They build right and left circuits. They build frontal lobe, back circuits. Their brain is so much better. Now, what confuses people about aging is that there is one thing that occurs that confuses everyone, and that's word finding. Like I couldn't think of William James. So as you get older, hmm. Oh, I can't think of it. What is that? What is it? That is typical. And that happens as you get older. And that's confused with deteriorating memory. Uh, when an actual right. fact, 
the older brain that's been active is far better in terms of pattern recognition. They're very good at pattern recognition, seeing situations, seeing circumstances, seeing uh, patterns in everything, you know, in emotions and learning, and et cetera. So uh, there's no question about it, but it, but it, but it, it's it's a use it or lose it thing. You have to be using the brain to build these circuits. And so that's why people need to be active in in their brain. No, it's yeah. Not to, yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah. And that reminds me, the expert is the one who is experienced. Uh, I think now expert just means expert knowledge, uh, but but it used to mean um, being experienced in a certain thing. And, and certainly the aging brain is experienced in a lot of things. Right. Mm. So, There's so much... We, I mean, medicine, everyone says, well, everyone knows psychiatry is not an exact science. Well, just look at cardiology. It's not an yes. exact science. Just yeah. look at every field of medicine. It's not exact. It's, uh, it has judgment calls. There's so many judgment calls involved. Uh, you know, there's just so many factors in every situation. You know, so you have, well, the kidneys are like this, and the, the lungs mm -hmm. are like this, and the diabetes is like this, and the, the hyper... So... They have 20 different forces going on. There's no guidelines in that situation. There's no guidelines when you have 20 different things going on. The, the, it, I talk about interactions, like what we learn about drugs. So we learn, if you look at all the interactions that we know about scientifically, they're all one drug with another drug. Mm -hmm. But a typical patient that I see is on 15 drugs, and the older people. No one has any idea what that means of how that is. So it comes back to experience. And again, some doctors have more experience than others and, and are, are also willing to be more humble and not realize that they know everything. I mean, it, it's kind of frightening being a doctor. They expect you to know things that you can't possibly know and to uh, you know make decisions of life and death, which we do, uh, but we're doing it on judgment calls. There's, there's a good... Is yeah, that degree okay. of interpretation? I, I remember in in the, the master's degree, we we had a, a, a we would do little work groups looking at uh, case studies, and there was a young uh, person in the group who was brilliant, and uh, she could tick boxes faster than anybody, and she could see the detail and those sort of elements of remembering this and that. And um, it would be very annoying. She would find it very annoying when I would say, oh, I don't know, I think it doesn't feel right. There's just some of the things that were said. And, and it was very interesting that uh, not all the time, but maybe sort of seven out of 10 times, actually, I was more accurate than she was when you just overlaid that, um, that understanding, that, that, that oh, what do we call it? We call it intuition. We call it uh, wisdom, uh, all kinds of things, wisdom, intelligence, that, that value, but this, um, mm. the value of the brain that continues to be active and meaningful is, right. is a great message to, that, that comes out of what you've just said. Beautiful. All right. Wonderful. Well, I think we should wrap it up. That's been a wonderful conversation. I, we didn't get onto viruses. <laughs> maybe, we, maybe we, another. we alluded, we tapped, we, we tapped them a little bit on the edges. <laughs> yeah, we did. We did. We did. Um, but is there anything, any sort of final thoughts, John, that you'd like to you know, say? Well, I think the most important thing I already said is that the science, if you look at science, which I do, it's very, very clear. There's no question about it that right now everyone is wrong it, about this competition thing that all the way in the brain, in the body, the immune, in the molecules, everywhere you look, it's, it's cooperation and signaling and communication and um, the back and forth. That's the nature of, of life. That's the nature of intelligence. That's the nature of our existence. So I, th I, I think we've lost that. I think we, we don't realize that it's cooperation and communication that is the central part of of of, of, of life mm. um and we've we've given in to this negative competitive thing and look at look at where it's getting us i mean we're getting into horrible conflicts everywhere i mean 
anyway, so that's, yeah. that's a whole other story. It's, it's reflecting in the social uh, environment. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Okay. That's that's uh, that's enriching, sobering, and uh, and inspiring. Uh, it's been really wonderful to talk to you, John. Dr. Likewise. John Leaf, thank you so much for joining us here on the Science of Psychotherapy podcast.